the Comic Weekly Man, the jolly Comic Weekly Man, and I'm here to read the funnies to you happy boys and honeys. Yes, boys and girls, it's Comic Weekly time, and here I come right into your house to bring a little fun and happiness. Right out of the pages of Puck the Comic Weekly, straight into your living room, your friend, the Comic Weekly Man, the jolly Comic Weekly Man. Hello, 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 hello. Hello, 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 hello. Well, little Miss Honey, how are you today? Oh, I'm fine, and I have another surprise for you. Oh, that's wonderful. What is it? Well, two more of my friends told me I should tell you that you're their favorite storyteller. So now will you read the funnies today, especially so that I can tell them that I told you what they told me to tell you? Well, I certainly will. What are their names? Michael and Christopher. Well, then, we'll read the funnies today for Michael and Christopher and all of their friends. Fine. Now I can tell them I told you what they told me to tell you. So read the funnies, please. Fuck the comic weekly? Very well, I will in just a moment. But before I do, let's listen to this nice man. Now, here we go with Puck the Comic Weekly. And on the first page, hop along, Cassidy. Magic words for the music, please. Very well, my lady. Six guns blazing as he thunders along. Give us music for hop along. <laughs> Sloat thought Hoppy and his pals would lose their way in the rock maze and die there. But fortunately, Topper missed Hoppy and Nade. Hoppy followed the sound of Topper's winning and found their way out. Hoppy and his pals pick up Sloat's trail. First picture, second row, Hoppy says, His mount's hoof prints with a dented shoe are still with us, headed straight toward Buckskin. <laughs> Meanwhile, Sloat has been sent to Dr. Wiley by Brand, the head of the three crooks that had found him in the rock maze. First picture, third row, he enters the doctor's office. The doctor says, Well, what can I do for you, stranger? Sloat replies, I had a little shooting accident out of the rock maze. Brand sent me. The doctor looks at Sloat's arm, last picture, third row, saying, Well, you're fortunate. Brand doesn't approve of everybody. Now, first, we'll have a look at that arm. After that, if you're interested, maybe I can put you next to some easy spending money. Sloat looks at the doctor and says slyly, You can do better than that, Doc. I don't savvy what kind of game you're running here. But suppose you cut me in on it. Fifty-fifty. The doctor answers, first picture, fourth row. Why, you two-bit tin horn, who do you think you are? Don't remember me, eh? You were calling yourself Dr. Worth when they ran you out of St. Joe. Then there was that phony mail-order prescription racket you worked in Denver. The doctor pours hot water into a basin, saying, Slow, huh? Didn't recognize you with those, without those chin whiskers. Sloat answers, last picture, fifth row. You seem to have latched onto some easy pickings. I wouldn't want to ruin it. Are we agreed on a partnership? The doctor answers, Sure, Sloat, sure. I uh, only hope you weren't tailed. Sloat replies, Don't worry. A galoot named Hopalong Cassidy and two of his pods tried that. But Brandon and his boys took care of him. At this moment... Underneath the very window where Sloat and Doc Wiley are talking, Hoppy and his pals, last picture, are riding down the street. Oh, Sloat and the doctor are standing in the window right above him. I hope that Sloat doesn't see Hoppy. So do I. If he did, that would spoil any chance of Hoppy's catching Sloat by surprise later. Oh, we'll find out more about that next week, won't we? We certainly will. Now? Let's turn over the page and let's see if Prince Valiant is on page three. All right, over we go. Yes, there he is. And you remember last week, Val was successful on his mission. Yes, he was. The Pope has agreed to send missionaries to Val's father and bring word of Christianity to the land of Thule. And then Val got a letter saying that Arth, that young boy he left behind, was dying. And Val left his friends to arrange to bring the missionaries and rode on by himself to see his young friend Arth. I want to see if he gets there today. Very well, here we go with Prince Valiant to the days of King Arthur. Heck it, break it, Grey Malkin and Quince. Music romantic for a fair, fair prince. <laughs> Prince Valiant rides into Torino and slides stiffly from his spent horse at the convent door. On the long journey, he had time to realize how much he loves his young squire, and he hopes he has arrived in time. (laughs) 
As he goes in the door, the doctor gives a tragic report. Young Arf bore his agony like a warrior, despite his tender years. But now he's dying, for he has no will to live. Val walks into the room where Arf is, last picture top roll. By a sunny window, Arf lies, white-faced, still as death. One foot is still swathed in bandages, and the other, with a shock, Val sees first picture next row, there's no other foot. He sits down and takes the lad's hand. A bright smile lights Arf's pale face for an instant, and then drains away. And then he speaks bitterly, last picture, second row. I aimed too high. I was to be Sir Arf Jeffrey, knight of the round table, a great warrior. All my life I've dreamed a vain dream, of being a champion and, and, and serving my lady Alita as her knight errant. And he laughs cynically, first picture, bottom row, as his head falls back on the pillow. Who ever heard of a one-legged warrior? Val answers coldly. I have. Arf looks up sharply. He'd expected sympathy from his generous, warm-hearted chief. He hears Val say, last picture, but I've never heard of a great warrior quitting the field when the fight's to be won. Well, why isn't Val more friendly to Arf? After all, it's very sad that he lost his leg. Well, Val's being this way to make Arf stop feeling sorry for himself. Because if Arf doesn't feel sorry for himself, then he'll think of all the things he can still do in life. Oh, then he'll work harder to do those things. That's exactly what Val hopes will happen. But Val still loves Arf, and he really does feel sorry, doesn't he? Oh, I'm sure that Val's heart's almost breaking over Arf's unfortunate situation. And he's doing this really to do Arf a kindness and to help him. My, I hope that Arf understands that. Oh, I'm sure he will. Well, now, what do you say we read Donald Duck? Oh, I just love Donald Duck. Please read that. Very well, then. Let's turn over the page, go past Jungle Jim, turn over another page, and there, in the middle of page seven, is Donald Duckle. Good for a chuckle. Say the magic words with me. Squee, jump, jump squee, jump, squee, 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 squee,
Everybody's busy working down at the office. When all of a sudden, Mr. Dither's door opens. And he roars. Tell Bumstead to come into my office at once. And then Mr. Dither slams his door. Everyone looks very sad. You can hear a pin drop. Whoops, wrong pin. One of the men says, Ooh, the boss is in a rage. Another says, Yeah, he sounds like a maniac. Dagwood very timidly walks toward Mr. Dither's office. He goes in, closes the door, when suddenly... There's a terrific fight. Everybody in the office is terrified. And one of the men says sadly, Poor Dagwood! Suddenly everything is quiet again. First picture, next row. Mr. Dithers is standing over Dagwood with a broken ball bat in his hands, and Dagwood lies on the floor covered with bruises. Mr. Dithers snarls, Did you put this note on my desk asking for a raise? Dagwood replies, Yes, sir. Mr. Dithers leaps at him again. How much of a raise did you have in mind? As they both pause for breath, <laughs> last picture, second row, Dagwood answers, Ten dollars a week. Mr. Dither screeches, Ten dollars! And leaps to Dagwood again, first picture, next row. <laughs> it's robbery! <laughs> Suddenly there's an extra loud crash. And one of the men outside the office yells, Hey, quick, somebody, run to the first aid room. Get a stretcher for Dagwood. The mailboy runs for a stretcher while back inside the room, Mr. Dither's last picture of the row smashes a water cooler over Dagwood's head. And then first picture bottom row, Mr. Dither's picks Dagwood up and bumps his head on the desk. And then Mr. Dither's, all worn out from his struggles, collapses on Dagwood, who collapses to the floor. And Mr. Dither's says, Okay, Dagwood, I'll tell the cashier... To increase your salary, $10 a week, starting today. (sighs) And Dagwood, looking like a mop rag, says weakly, Thank you, boss. Last picture, the office employees pick Dagwood up from the ruined office, lay him on a stretcher, and carry him out. And Dagwood gives a crooked smile and says weakly, He's a sweet old guy. After you learn to understand him. Oh, good gracious. Did you ever see anything so silly in your life? Fighting like that just because he has to give Dagwood a raise in pay. (laughs) I'm sure this could only happen in the funny papers. But I'm sure also that that's the way some people feel about you having to give a raise. The <laughs> funny papers, they certainly are funny. Yes. Oh, look, here's Roy Rogers below Dagwood and Blondie. Read that, please. I'll read that in just a moment. But first, here's that nice man again with something interesting to say. Now, here we go again with Puck the Comic Weekly. And on page one of the second section, bottom of the page, Roy Rogers, King of the Cowboys. Magic words for the music, please. Very well, my lady. yip hi Now, here we go with Roy and Trigger. yip hi Stogie Grimes riding Trigger, Roy's horse is closing in on the spot where Roy is hiding. Suddenly, Roy whistles, and Trigger bucks Grimes off. Roy runs for Grimes, who pulls his gun. The girl, Wild Widow Dowd, sees what's happening and throws a rock, knocking the gun out of Trogi's hand. Roy hollers, nice going, Wildwood, and gives Stogie Grimes a punch in the jaw, saying, Ugh. Now, you and Glib Mason can tell the sheriff how you plan to rustle the cattle Mason bought for the rawhide ranchers with their money. <laughs> Later, last picture top row, in Rawhide, Roy and his friend Doleful Hawkins and Wildwood are bringing Grimes and Mason into the sheriff ahead of the herd of cattle which Black Jack has led over the mountain safely. Roy says, Well, there's the sheriff's office. I'll deliver Mason and Stogie while you deliver the herd. First picture bottom row, the townspeople see Doleful Hawkins at the head of the herd, and one of the men shouts, Hooray! Here's Doleful Hawkins with our fresh rain stock! There's a big celebration later in the day, and the mayor of the town, after making a speech, is giving Doleful a key to the city. And he says, Angel Doleful Hawkins, 
My citizens of Rawhide present you, our savior, with a key to the city. And Dolfo, who seems to find something wrong with everything in life, answers, Thanks, Mayor, but it won't open nothing, will it? I'll probably drop it on my foot and bust a toe. <laughs> Later, the celebration over, Roy's preparing to leave. The sheriff is saying to him, Well, I'll take care of Mason and Grimes, Rogers. Hey, that Palomino looks familiar. Saw one just like him yesterday. He even had the same markings. A curious look comes in Roy's eyes, and he says, Why, there's not another Palomino with these markings except Trigger Jr., and he's supposed to be at the Double R Bar Ranch. Hey, let's go, boy. And he leaps on Trigger, heading out of town. The sheriff calls... A strange hombre led him through town, seemed in a hurry, hated self. Oh, my. Do you think that something might have happened to Trigger Jr.? Somebody stole him, maybe? I think that's what Roy's worried about, and that's why he's riding off in such a hurry. Oh, there's never a moment's rest for Roy. The minute he's turned one crook over the sheriff, there's something else he has to do. Yes, it seems that way. Well, maybe next week we'll begin a new adventure that'll center around Trigger Jr. Oh, that'll be wonderful. Fine. Well, now let's go over the page oh, and... Oh, there's Flash Gordon. And remember, he's on the moon. And last week, he and Dale and Professor Bright had found an entrance to an underground tunnel. Yes, but they were seen by Rock, a man from Earth, who is apparently the leader of the Beetlemen. And yes, and, and remember, Rock saw Flash through a special kind of machine which he had. He could see anything through it. And then as Flash neared his chamber, he fired the whip tentacles, a strange kind of weapon that sailed swiftly through the air and tangled Dale and Professor Bright up in a lot of strings so that they couldn't move. Quick, read and see what happens next. Very well, here we go with Flash Gordon. rega rega doon doon saskimatash Let's have music for heroic Flash. <laughs> Deep under the moon's surface, Flash finds his mysterious foe is a human. Hampered by the whip tentacles that have entangled him, Flash fires at the villainous rock, but misses. And Flash charges toward rock, and his enemy retaliates by shooting a cloud of numbing brain gas. Holding his breath, Flash tries to fire his ray gun, but the gas fills his eyes and ears, making him feel strangely weak and dizzy. Last picture top row, choking from the acrid fumes, Flash tears off his spacesuit in an agonized attempt to breathe. Rack grins evilly and says, Now you'll pay the penalty for following me from the doomed earth. First picture, bottom row, while Flash is struggling for air, a group of Rax beetle men enter the fray, dazed by the gas. Flash can only put up a feeble resistance as the beetle men bind him and Dale with spun glass ropes. Then, last picture, Flash, Dale, and Professor Bright are lined up against the cavern wall and given an impromptu trial. Rock acts as prosecutor. He harangues. I came from Earth to make you Beetlemen powerful. These strangers wrecked our moon gun. They want to conquer your planet. Flash tries to reply, but the Beetlemen shout him down. The verdict is unanimous. Destroy the Earth people. <laughs> that Flash would shoot that mean man, Rock. And instead of that, those tentacles that were wrapped around Flash's arm spoiled his aim. And now Flash is in Rock's power. And all the Beetlemen want Flash to be destroyed. Well, does that mean that they'll be killed? That's something we'll find out next week. Oh, I certainly won't miss this. But I hope Flash will find some way of fooling them all. So do I. But now... Now it's time for Dick's adventures, isn't it? It certainly is. So let's go past Buzz Sawyer, the Lone Ranger, the Phantom, to the last page... And Dick's adventures. Something very mysterious is happening because Dick is there at West Point, and that's a famous American fort in the early days of America. Yes, and General Benedict Arnold is the commander there. And Arnold had told Dick there was to be an exchange of English and American prisoners of war and had sent Dick to wait at the river's edge for an Englishman, Major Andre, who was to represent the English. But you said that usually this is done in the daytime under a special kind of a flag. But this is all being done very mysteriously at night. And Dick thinks that there's something wrong about all this. Yes, there is. Well, let's read now and see what there really is. Very well. Here we go with Dick's adventures. Say the magic words with me. Riggedy pack a zack a zick. Let's have music for adventurous Dick. Mr. 
mystery and something more disturbing surrounds the secretive midnight arrival of a British officer named Major Andre outside the closely guarded ramparts of West Point. Uneasily, Dick reports to the American Commandant, General Benedict Arnold. Dick tells the General that Major Andre is waiting for him outside the fort. Showing little surprise, the general accompanies Dick to a thickly wooded section on the banks of the Hudson where the enemy officer waits. Dick sees the two generals shake hands. Then he walks a short distance off to stand guard over them while the two talk. Last picture of the row, for an hour, in darkness, the two men converse cautiously while Dick, obeying orders, stands guard just out of earshot. Yet, first picture next row, he catches a glimpse of papers being passed from General Arnold to Major Andre and sees them being stuffed into the British officer's boot. Then, General Arnold calls Dick over, saying, Sergeant, you will escort Major Andre back to the place where he can reboard the ship. He is not to be stopped by any of our men. As Dick leads Major Andre back to the edge of the river... He's thinking of what General Arnold had told him, that Major Andre has come to arrange for the exchange of colonial and British prisoners of war. But Dick wonders why all the secrecy. Just as they reach the river's edge, last picture of the row, they hear... It's American cannon atop the ramparts of West Point, which have opened thunderous fire. The British sloop awaiting Major Andre's return has been spotted at the dawn. And as they watch the shots striking the water around the ship, Major Andre, seeing that it's become bright dawn, cries to Dick, I can't leave now. Hide me somewhere. Oh, he's really worried now, isn't he? Indeed he is, because now Major Andre can't get out to his ship and get away. Well, maybe it's a good thing, because I think there's something wrong about those papers that he's carrying in his boots. And I think you'll find out you're right, and maybe next week we'll learn more about the mysterious papers and Major Andre. I can hardly wait. Oh, well, look, there's Rusty Riley right underneath Dick's adventures. You remember last week Rusty and Tex uh, couldn't get over that sort of island they were on, and they found that train engine. Yes, that's right, and they put their horse Blaze on a flat car, and luckily enough got the train started. And now they're on the way, across the trembling trestle, hoping it won't crash beneath the weight of the engine. Yes, and just as that happened, that man Smith that they were trying to get away from, because he has a gun, it came up to the top of the hill and aimed at him. And I'm anxious to see whether he hurts Rusty or Tex. Well, let's find right now, uh, read right now and find out. So here we go with Rusty Riley. Gallop and run till the road is dusty. Give us music for his horse and Rusty. <laughs> As the train moves faster and faster across the trestle leading from the lumber camp, Smith throws his gun to his shoulder and calls, You don't stop and back up, I'll fire! Rusty shouts, Hey, Tex, he's going to shoot! Tex replies, Turn your back on him, Rusty. We're way out of range of that bird shot. Can't do more than sting a little. Smith fires. Blaze rears up and prances about. Rusty, holding his halter, says, Go now, Blaze. Easy, boy. Hey, golly, Tex, he fired both barrels and some of the burst shot must have stung Blaze. Tex calls back. Now, we're over the trestle now, Rusty. We're on even terms with him now. There were only two shells in the gun. <laughs> Meanwhile, last picture top row, in a cabin in the valley, a man dressed in a woodsman's outfit is having a cup of coffee. Suddenly he exclaims... Hey, by Jiminy, it sounds like the whistle in the lumber company's little tank engine. There ain't supposed to be anybody working up there. He gets up, goes to the phone, first picture bottom row saying, you better call the forestry lookout in the fire tower. Maybe there's a fire. In the fire tower, high at the top of the mountain, the fire ranger sitting in front of a telescope gets the call. As he answers, the man on the phone says, Hello, uh, this is Deputy Game Warden Cox. Something must be up at the Deep Gorge Lumber Camp. I heard the whistle of that dinky locomotive. Can you see anything? The man in the tower replies, Why, yeah, Link, I heard it too. Uh, Somebody ran the engine in the flat car over the old trestle. I notified the sheriff. (laughs) Meanwhile, back in the woods, Tex has stopped the train and they've led Blaze off. Dex says to Rusty, All right, Rusty. 
Get Blaze back into the woods. Stay there with him. That loco hombre is crossing the trestle. I can handle him now that his ammunition's gone. Rusty replies, Well, okay, Tex, but golly, be careful. He's dangerous. Tex walks toward the trestle, which Smith has just crossed. The men meet last picture, and Smith snarls. Well, thought you'd trick me, didn't you? Well, now we're going to have a showdown. Give me the paper that was in the back of that picture frame, or I'll take you apart. Tex replies, Okay, mister. Just take off them specs. Ooh, and now Tex and Smith are going to fight it out, aren't they? You bet, and Tex has a mighty grim look on his face, and he's mad because he doesn't like crooks. I hope that Smith doesn't have a pistol or a knife. Well, I think Tex will be careful. And, and, and I heard that forest ranger say that he'd called the sheriff. My, I hope he gets there in time because then Tex could turn this man over to the sheriff, and then we could find out what those secret plans are. That's Miss Stoll. Yes, there's a lot of things we have to find out next week. Yes, and I'll certainly be here. Good. Well, now that's all the time I have. But before I go, here's that nice man with some more interesting information. Well, honey, and all you boys and girls, I gotta go now. All right. Mr. County Gleefy Man, but I'll be waiting for you next week. Okay, that's a date. And a date with all you boys and girls. Be sure to meet me with our little friend, Miss Honey, next week when I read Puck the Comic Weekly. For I'm the Comic Weekly Man, the jolly Comic Weekly Man. I'll be back to read the funnies to you happy boys and honeys. Don't forget, boys and girls, see you all next week. Your friend, the Comic Weekly Man, the jolly Comic Weekly Man.